Welcome to the CDA Institute's Expert Series, the podcast that brings you in-depth conversations with the brightest minds in defense, security, foreign policy, and international relations. Each week, we delve into the most pressing issues facing our world today. Tensions have escalated in the South China Sea as China engaged in deliberate acts of provocation, including colliding with a Philippine Coast Guard ship and a supply vessel near a contested outpost known as Second Thomas Shoal. This aggressive behavior has been condemned by the Philippines as dangerous, irresponsible, and illegal. The incident highlights the ongoing dispute over territorial claims in the South China Sea and the need for continued international attention to prevent future escalation. The South China Sea dispute has global implications due to its impact on international trade, regional stability, and potential military conflicts, drawing in major global powers. The ongoing contest in the area challenges international law and the rules-based order. The South China Sea is a semi-enclosed sea in East Asia, covering approximately 3.5 million square kilometers. It's bordered by China to the north, Vietnam to the west, the Philippines to the east, and several other countries, including Malaysia and Brunei along its southern coast. The primary source of the dispute is the competing territorial claims over islands, rocks, reefs, and waters within the South China Sea. Several features within the region are claimed by multiple countries, including China, Taiwan, Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Brunei. The South China Sea is rich in natural resources, including oil, natural gas, fish, and valuable shipping lanes. These resources are a significant incentive for countries to assert their claims and control over the region. In today's episode, Bill Hayton, Gregory Poling, and John Blacksland discuss the implications of recent tensions between the Philippines and China in the Second Thomas Shoal, territorial claims and disputes in the South China Sea, the regional implications of China's maritime ambitions, and the importance of regional forums like the Quad. This is the Expert Series. I want to be clear. I want to be very clear. The United States defense commitment to the Philippines is ironclad. The United States defense agreement to the Philippines is ironclad. Any attack on the Filipino aircraft vessels or armed forces will invoke a mut- our mutual defense treaty with the Philippines. The Philippines firmly rejects misleading narratives that frame the disputes in the South China Sea solely through the lens of strategic competition between two powerful countries. This not only denies us our independence and our agency, but it also disregards our own legitimate interests. Hello, and thanks for tuning in. First, we'll be speaking with Dr. Bill Hayton, Chatham House Associate Fellow. Bill, pleasure to meet you, and thanks for joining me today. How do these recent incidents between Chinese and Filipino vessels in the South China Sea impact the ongoing territorial disputes in the region? And what is the broader significance of this incident for regional security? Yeah, I think whenever we talk about South China Sea, we have to remember that there are two sets of disputes. There are territorial disputes about who owns the rocks and the reefs, and then there are maritime disputes about the spaces in between the rocks and the reefs, like who has the rights to the fish and the oil and the gas, and that kind of thing. Um, but there's also a sort of geopolitical, you know, contest on the top of that in China, the U.S., other states, Japan, uh, European countries, Australia, Canada, um, about you know freedom of access and, and all the rest of it. And so this dispute kind of has has elements of all of those. Really, that's what makes it complicated and, and potentially dangerous. Um, but the heart of this dispute at the Second Thomas Shoal, which um, we've seen uh, in video clips, uh, is about a, a, a reef. Uh, onto which the Philippines rammed a ship in 1999. Um, And that ship has been steadily rusting for a quarter of a century and is in danger of falling apart. Uh, The Chinese would like to see it completely fall apart and the Marines who are living on that ship uh, disappear. Uh, The Philippines thinks that if that happens, then China will occupy the reef um, and it will become another military outpost of China. Um, And so that then sort of brings in the US and other states as well who are concerned about China's uh, island building activities. Um, so what we've seen, and, and I think this is key, is that we've seen it. Um, the Philippines has made a deliberate effort to publicize what's been going on by videoing it and releasing the video, taking journalists on trips and all that kind of stuff. So I think what we're seeing is a deliberate public diplomacy strategy here from the Philippine side. Um, 
and you know it's clear that the Americans have been talking to them. We've seen American planes flying overhead. Um, we've seen the sort of release of you know sympathetic uh, comments from American diplomats, that that kind of thing. So um, you know what we're seeing is a sort of struggle over this particular reef, but it plays into a much bigger picture about uh, you know, what China's up to in the South China Sea and how that connects to Taiwan and, and, and other regional issues. What are the key territorial claims in the South China Sea and which countries are involved in these disputes? Furthermore, what are the implications of China's strategic interests in the region? Well, uh, there are four real main countries that, that claim features in the South China Sea. So you've got uh, China, obviously, Vietnam, uh, the Philippines and Malaysia. Brunei claims a little uh, reef which isn't um, occupied. Uh, the China part of the claim, you know, you've got a the, the claim, you know, emerged in the first half of the 20th century and was predominantly put forward by the Republic of China before 1949, um, and was then inherited by the People's Republic of China after 1949. And so you do have a sort of a complication there. You've got a Taiwan Republic of China claim and a PRC, you know, Communist China claim. Um, so, you know, Taiwan is also a player in this for historical reasons. So China first published a, a line around the South China Sea uh, in a, an, an official map in sort of 1947-48 period. Um, it's never really made clear exactly what that line means, but it's, it, at the very least, it includes a notional claim to every rock and reef that lies within that um, line. Uh, the Vietnam claims all of the Paris Islands, which are currently occupied by China, uh, and all of the Spratly Islands. Um, and the Spratly Islands are occupied in different ways by Vietnam, which occupies more than half, by China, which has you know, seven very large bases there on artificial islands. One is controlled by Taiwan, uh, nine or ten by the Philippines, and a similar number by Malaysia. Um, and so there's a sort of struggle over who actually occupies each reef and then there's a sort of wider thing about you know the, the resources that may or may not lie nearby what historical events and factors have contributed to the current state of conflict in the south china sea well i mean if we go all the way back to the 1930s i'm afraid the chinese claim was based on a series of uh, mistranslations of uh, british maps and other documents um and this has resulted in for example china claiming some non-existent islands uh, as part of its territory um, so there's a sort of slightly absurd element to, to some of this. Um, it was made more serious by the discovery of oil and gas reserves uh, in the region in sort of the 1960s, late 60s, early 70s. That led to a series of moves. And obviously offshore oil and gas is quite significant for some of the countries in the region, uh, for Brunei, for, for the Philippines, for Malaysia and Indonesia and Vietnam. Um, and to uh, a degree... To, to, to China, but at, that these are all areas which are much closer to the coasts of these countries and not really so much in the areas which are under dispute, by and large. Um, but the uh, efforts to try and resolve the territorial claims have never really got anywhere. Um, there are, in theory, rules to divide up the sea by maritime uh, agreements uh, under UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, and that's what the Philippines tried to do back in 2013 by bringing a case against China at an international tribunal. But China refused to accept uh, the case uh, so that that tribunal has ruled and basically said, you know, resources in a particular part of the sea belong to the Philippines. But China has refused to accept that. And there is quite a large gas field uh, close to the area that's being contested at the moment. Uh, between the Philippines and China, um, which would enormously help the Philippines uh, if it could develop that. But uh, China is, in effect, blocking the development of what's called the Reed Bank. How would you say assumptions made by Western analysts about China's motivations in the South China Sea impact the interpretation of their actions? Well, I think um, a lot of our outsiders' views of what China's up to Often they sometimes they reflect our own concerns about things like sea lanes and free navigation, that kind of thing. I think China's main interest in this is a sense of sort of legitimacy that it, it's the rightful owner of these uh, rocks and reefs. Um, and I think maybe outsiders tend to play that down a bit uh, or underestimate it. Um, 
So, you know, I think this is what drives the Chinese behavior here is an underlying sense that they are the legitimate owners of the South China Sea. You know, I, I can prove that there's all kinds of holes in that narrative, um, but I don't think that many Chinese officials read my narratives. Um, so there's a kind of, you know, I think there's a complete, you know, clash of, of views here with um, Chinese officials, you know, Navy captains, whatever, thinking that they're right and that these other countries, these Southeast Asian countries, are only doing what they're doing because they're being made to do so by sort of Uncle Sam, the sort of the American puppet master behind them. It's a complete failure to understand that these Southeast Asian countries have their own interests, which they are pursuing, um, and that they are concerned about resources, oil and gas and fish and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I think, you know, we under, need to under, understand and actually sort of, um, if we can, try and undermine this Chinese territorial narrative, because I think that underpins everything else that flows from it. Um, and if we kind of, you know, keep repeating that this is about, you know, upholding agreements which China has signed about maritime rights and all the rest of it, uh, UNCLOS, um, uh, and that, you know, this is really about small countries, you know, trying to stand up for their rights against a big country. Um, I think those are the sort of um, narratives that would work well uh, in Southeast Asian countries. What has been the impact of so-called great power competition between the United States and China on regional dynamics? Well, that's a big question. Um, and I think it's different in every country. Um, in, in every country, you know, there are uh, business and foreign policy interests, you know, that, that might prefer to lean in, in one direction or another. I think we should tr try to avoid flattening this discussion into something that's just US and China. Um, a lot of these countries are looking for as many different you know, potential patrons or poles as possible, you know, Vietnam and, and Laos and Myanmar still reach out to Russia, for example, uh, despite what's going on in Ukraine. Um, you know, Japan is an important player. The European Union is trying to get involved in the UK, um, Australia and, and Canada. And so, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of the Southeast Asians, this interest is, is welcome. Um, obviously, the, the Chinese don't like it. They just want to kind of keep this between them and the, and the ASEAN states, which is why the ASEAN states are, you know, more and more, more keen to involve others in what's going on. So don't just see it as a simple kind of US-China dichotomy, I think. But in every case, you know, you've got, you know, arguments about, you know, which kind of uh, economic framework you're going to adopt. You know, are you going to go for a sort of free and open um uh, agenda, you know, sort of American Japanese style, or are you going to sort of go for a sort of Belt and Road Initiative uh, type Chinese style? And to be honest, most Southeast Asian countries, I think, will will, will try and take whatever advantages they can get. And uh, in some ways, it's a good time for them. They can play off all these different potential suitors against each other and see, you know, if they can get you know double deals or better deals. Um, uh, another time, another you know sense, it's also quite risky because when the forces of competition are so sharp. Um, so strong, uh, then there's plenty of you know ways that you know what might be relatively small issues can become magnified because of the great power involvement. Can you speak to the implications of the inclusion of Taiwan within the new dash line and what it means for cross-strait relations? Yeah, I'm a bit skeptical about this idea that somehow this new map that was published in August represented anything new. I mean, we've known that the PRC, Communist China, has claimed Taiwan, you know, since you know, 1949, since, since the beginning. So, uh, and there was never really any sense, um, you know, for maps published after 1949 that Taiwan was not included in the Chinese claim. Um, so I, I think basically really what we've seen is a sort of actually more to do with the way that the map is presented. And so you get to see these extra dashes. Um, you know, the, the, the line itself, you know, was originally published, had 11 dashes, and then it went down to two after uh, an agreement between the Chinese and Vietnamese communist parties. Um, but the you know, the 10th dash was always notionally there, I think. It's just that maybe it just wasn't, you know, seen on, on a map in, in the same way. Um, but I mean, Taiwan is an important part of the South China Sea puzzle, although it's often spoken about in, in, two, in separate conversations. I think, for example, one of the reasons why China has built these massive bases in the Spratly Islands uh, is as a sort of contingency, uh, in, if there was ever some kind of Taiwan military operation, these bases would help to keep American and other forces 
out of the South China Sea and unable to 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 reach Taiwan from from that direction. Um, then there's also the sort of uh, the question of whether China is using the South China Sea as uh, a bastion in which to hide its submarines. And and in those if that's true, then you know these South China Sea island bases play a, a key role in that anti-submarine game that's going on. Um, and then obviously the, the the wider question is that you know Taiwan and the and the various islands in the South China Sea form uh China's you know territorial claim in you know, a maritime territorial claim if you like um so they are sort of seen as as as, as being of a piece uh, if you like so and of course then there's the sort of the great power stuff so things which if the US is helping the Philippines in around the second Thomas Shoal at the moment in the Chinese perspective that also um means the you know the US is sort of you know, it's also involved in Taiwan, it's involved in Japan, and I think the Chinese don't think these are separate theatres. They kind of see American actions as being, you know, all, all part of a piece um, and, and intent, aimed at sort of, you know, containment or provoking China in some way. So although I think often outsiders might try and compartmentalise South China Sea, East China Sea, Taiwan as separate questions, I, I wouldn't think that the Chinese see it quite the same way. I have one more uh, question for you, Dr. Hayton. Um, how might the South China Sea, from your perspective, evolve in the coming years? And, and what strategies do you think might be employed to prevent further confrontation or um, promote cooperation in the region? Well, in, in theory, there's this very simple set of solutions to the South China Sea disputes. You know, one is that the various countries involved simply agree that they're going to hold on to the islands and reefs that they currently hold on to and, 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 and not claim any others. Um, and then try and reassure each other about their intentions. And the other part is that they agree to the rules of UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and just divide up the fish and the oil and gas that way. I think pretty much all the Southeast Asian states would be willing to sign up to that. Uh, the problem is that China is not. So how does one incentivize China to do that? It's very, very hard. The ASEAN countries, Association of Southeast Asian Nation countries, um, have been talking about a code of conduct with China for the for more than 25 years now, and it hasn't got anywhere. Um, and they don't really seem to have any leverage to kind of make China, uh, you know, settle for anything less than China's maximal terms, if you like. Um, so you know, there's a sort of um, you know, I, I think a kind of weary resignation on the part of the Southeast Asian countries that. This is a problem to be managed rather than a problem to be solved. So they, you know, they look to outside powers uh, to help and support them. They don't want to be isolated. They want, you know, international uh, attention um, and lots of sort of reassurance that, that uh, you know, Western and other countries take the Southeast Asian countries' concerns seriously. Um, you know the. The direction of travel, of course, is that China is getting stronger militarily and that other countries' uh, relative uh, capacity to deploy naval forces is, is weakening. Um, and I think the Chinese just think they've got time on their side and they're just sort of, they can kind of keep on you know, building ships and eventually everybody else will give up. Um, so in that sense, I think it's important to sort of reassure Southeast Asian countries that they can stay the course on this. Um, and, you know, I, I think things may come to a head towards the end of the decade if, you know, um, China decides that then is the time that it wants to make some kind of move on Taiwan. I would be very surprised if they went for some kind of outright military intervention, but I think the idea that they would try and squeeze Taiwan and that therefore lots of other things would come into play and anything that involves Taiwan would be close to the Philippines um, and then start to bring in the rest of Southeast Asia. So, yeah, I think one needs to be ready for the idea that the South China Sea is going to be increasingly contested over the next sort of, you know, sort of five, 10 years. Um, and that something which starts off maybe in an unrelated way, like a collision between two fishing boats, you know, could end up bringing in some much bigger forces. Well, an interesting note to close things out, Dr. Hayden. I appreciate you joining us today. And thanks for sharing your valuable insights about territorial disputes in the South China Sea uh, amid these recent tensions between China and the Philippines. Now we'll turn to Southeast Asia and Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative Director at CSIS, Gregory Poling, to discuss China's tactics in the South China Sea, the maritime militia, 
China's military capabilities in the region and the implications of China's militarization of artificial islands in contested waters. Gregory, it's great to have you on today. Thanks for joining the CDAI. In the context of recent incidents involving the Philippines and growing tensions, how are regional dynamics and the balance of power in the South China Sea evolving and what potential scenarios should be considered for the future? At the moment, there are two places in the South China Sea that worry me and I think should are certainly worrying the U.S. government. One of those is the now monthly China-Philippines standoff around a feature called Second Thomas Shoal, where the Philippines maintains a small outpost aboard an old World War II era ship that's been intentionally ground on the reef since 1999. Uh, and the other is up in the air above the South China Sea, as well as the East China Sea and the Taiwan Strait, where we've seen a growing frequency of unsafe air intercepts. In the first case, China seems determined to block Philippine resupply missions to this ship, and the Philippines is determined to run that blockade, which is how you get increasingly unsafe interactions, including the collisions that happened early this month. In the latter case, uh, according to the US DOD, we've seen almost 300 unsafe Chinese intercepts of US or allied aircraft over the last two years, about one every two and a half days. That's included Australian and Canadian aircraft, most recently a couple weeks ago when a PLA jet almost collided with a Canadian jet uh, over the East China Sea. And just this week, when reportedly a Chinese jet came within 10 feet of a USB-52, which is insanely dangerous. What is the significance of recent incidents such as the ship collision in the South China Sea? And can you describe their relationship to China's maritime ambitions, maybe uh, touching on how they fit in with the concept of gray zones? So China has spent the last 10 years under Xi Jinping's leadership growing ever more assertive when it comes to what might be called the rights protection mission. The idea that uh, in the South China Sea in particular, there are the islands that were taken from China during the century of humiliation. That's all fiction, but that doesn't really matter. Um, it has become the motivating factor behind this effort to impose China's will on its smaller neighbors using primarily non-military means. So Coast Guard, maritime militia, and other state-owned or state-directed actors who stay just below the traditional threshold for military force, which makes it very difficult for states to know how to respond. That has been wildly successful for China over the last 10 years, steadily eating away at the ability of other states to control their own waters, their own resources. But now China seems to have hit a wall because the disputes have boiled down to just a couple of discrete locations, such as Second Thomas Shoal. And when the other party is willing to stand firm, as the Philippines is, gray zone no longer works. Gray zone only works if you can bully the other party into backing down. Instead, what we have now is just this regular monthly kind of ineffectual operation that increases the risk of accidental collision and escalation. And if there was an escalation around Second Thomas Shoal that, that caused a loss of life to a Filipino sailor, it's very easy to imagine the Philippines invoking the Article 4 commitments in the U.S.-Philippine Mutual Defense Treaty and then the U.S. getting involved militarily. Even worse would be if we had a collision in the air. Uh, another EP3 incident, for instance, like the 2001 incident in which a Chinese fighter jet collided with a U.S. EP3 surveillance aircraft, leading to the loss of life of the Chinese pilot in a weeks-long uh, standoff, that was at a time when we had much, much better crisis communication mechanisms than we do today. It's very easy for me to imagine a air-to-air -air collision that we wake up to tomorrow and the U.S. government can't even get the Chinese government on the phone for weeks until the spiral has already taken effect and we find ourselves in a really deep freeze that it's hard to get out of. What are the main military capabilities and facilities that China has deployed on its artificial island bases and how do they contribute to China's ability to dominate the South China Sea in the early stage of a potential conflict? So China spent the period from December 2013 until about mid-2016 building up the its artificial island bases in the Spratlys. There was virtually no dry land there before. Now there's over 3,000 acres. Added a couple hundred more up in the Paracel Islands to the north. China now has four pretty sophisticated air and naval bases in the Spratly Islands. I'm sorry, in the South China Sea. Three in the Spratlys, one in the Paracels. The most important thing that's done is it has allowed China to forward deploy dozens of Coast Guard vessels and hundreds of maritime militia vessels, which are state-owned actors in most cases, or at least state-directed, who pretend to be fishermen in order to hide their intentions and, and make uh, attribution impossible. They now have all of these forward-deployed 
in the Spratly Islands, 800 miles south of the Chinese mainland. And that means that in many cases, Chinese uh, patrol vessels are closer to, say, Philippine fishing grounds or Malaysian or Vietnamese oil and gas fields than those Southeast Asian countries are themselves. It's created the ability for China to maintain a presence 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's the basis of this gray zone strategy that has successfully pushed Southeast Asians out of their own waters over the last 10 years. Um, and frankly, that matters far more than what the islands could mean in a conflict. In a conflict, they would be highly complicated, um, not so much because of the strike capabilities on them. They all do have anti-ship cruise missiles and surface air missiles, but a single Chinese destroyer has more firepower than all these islands combined. Um, what really matters is that the islands are bristling with sensing and radar and communications uh, equipment. So it guarantees that China has persistent ISR, uh, surveillance ability, over the entire South China Sea, and nobody else does. So it's almost impossible to imagine U.S. vessels or aircraft operating without being immediately identified, plus the runways on the islands allow China to maintain a persistent aerial patrol. So China really now dominates the South China Sea in a hypothetical conflict in a way it didn't before. But but I think the key thing to remember is that the PLA has no intention to fight the U.S. 7th Fleet over the South China Sea. China intends to win that without fighting through gray zone, and it's been pretty successful in doing that. The militia is not a, um, you know, we're not taking poetic license here. These are not just fishermen who are hyped up on nationalism and get in trouble. These are an arm of the Chinese state. Uh, under China's 1982 military service law, young men who leave active duty military service, which is compulsory, are required to enroll in the militia. China has operated a maritime militia, which is basically just the young men who happen to be from fishing villages in the South China Sea since at least the 1970s. They were heavily involved, for instance, in the seizure of the Paracel Islands from South Vietnam in 1975. What's changed is that since 2012 or 13, the state has begun to put a lot more resourcing behind these militia to modernize them. In 2012, you had the infamous standoff at Scarborough Shoal in which China effectively seized control of that feature from the Philippines. That was provoked by uh, maritime militia units from a village called Tanmen in Hainan. In the wake of that operation, Xi Jinping, newly elevated to uh, president and head of the China Military Commission, Central Military Commission, went down to Tanmen with reporters in tow and on national TV thanked the Tanmen militia for their service and said that other militia across the nation should model themselves on the Tanmen militia. And since then, you can see an explosion in the numbers, in the size, and in the sophistication of the militia. Today, China operates probably something like 150 to 200 professional maritime militia vessels in the South China Sea. These are all owned and operated by a state-owned company called the Sancha Fisheries Development Company, and they're nominally registered to the Paracel Islands, although they mainly operate out of Hainan. In addition, you have several hundred more uh, pseudo-civilian vessels. These are what, in Chinese documents, are not called militia. They're called the Spratly Backbone Fishing Fleet, and they're basically subsidized to go down to the Spratly Islands and lie at anchor for the better part of a year. They don't fish, but they show the Chinese flag. That latter component is very annoying to the Philippines and to Vietnam, but it's not necessarily an immediate problem. The professional militia are. These are the ones that are contesting Philippine resupply missions around 2nd Thomas Shoal. They're harassing oil and gas operations across the South China Sea. They're harassing U.S. freedom of navigation operations and so on. And I think legally and operationally, um, if they present the risk of collision or risk to the, the uh, safety or lives of, of foreign mariners, they'll be treated as armed combatants, whether China realizes it or not. Can you dive a bit into the historical events and some of the factors that have contributed to the current state of tensions in the South China Sea, perhaps touching on some of the key territorial claims in the region and some of the disputes involved? Yeah, so uh, the South China Sea disputes are at this point, more than a century old. But the current status of the disputes is really the post-World War II um, history of the disputes, which is primarily a territorial dispute until the 1990s. Nobody was claiming water and seabed and airspace. That would have been ludicrous, um, you know, historically. You had the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China both claiming all of these islands, the Paracel Islands, 
which are in the north of the South China Sea, and the Spratly Islands in the south, plus a bunch of other stuff, including Scarborough Shoal, which is a small rock off the coast of Luzon, the main Philippine island. Uh, after World War II, well, really dating back to the 1930s, the Philippines also claimed a big chunk of the Spratlys, as well as Scarborough Shoal, which had been administered by the Philippines when it was a U.S. territory. Malaysia jumped in later in the game, claiming those islands and reefs that would lie on its continental shelf under international law. And even Brunei claims um, those that would lie on its continental shelf. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped the other big one, Vietnam. Vietnam claims all of the Paracels and all of the Spratlys, much like China. Although, to Vietnam's credit, it at least only claims the actual islands. China claims a lot of underwater stuff. Uh, none of that really mattered if you were outside of Southeast Asia. That wasn't a pressing issue for the U.S. or the Europeans or the Japanese. All we really cared about was that nobody used force to resolve those territorial disputes. The disputes began to expand and change in the 1990s when China decided that it no longer only claimed the islands, but instead also claimed what it now calls historic rights to all of the waters, all of the seabed, and all of the airspace of the South China Sea in direct violation of international law. And that directly infringes on the rights of third parties, including the United States. That's what brought the U.S. more directly into uh, the disputes. In 2009, China submitted that claim formally to a UN body. And then for the last 10 years under Xi Jinping's leadership, we've seen China really throwing its weight around to try to enforce those claims that had existed on paper for decades. I'd like to touch on cross-strait relations for a moment. What broader implications do China's territorial claims have for Taiwan? Well, there's a few ways that this, these interact. One, the claims that China meaning the government in Beijing currently makes, are ultimately ROC claims. They were first put out there by the nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek. Um, now, at the time, Chiang Kai-shek's government drew a dotted line, the infamous now nine-dash line in China or U-shaped line in Taiwan, as a, a cartographic shorthand because they didn't know where all the islands were. They didn't have a navy or a survey fleet. So they just said, we claim all the islands inside this line. Uh, China has taken that and run with it and now developed this much more expansive claim to waters and seabed. The ROC does not claim waters and seabed like China. So it is inaccurate to say that Taiwan's claim is identical to China's. It's really not. Um, but it does put Taiwan in an awkward position. It's uh, The Taiwanese government doesn't want to abandon its claims historically because that would be politically damaging, but it also doesn't really want to feed into this Chinese narrative. So for the most part, it just keeps quiet. Uh, Taiwan does, however, continue to occupy two islands. Taiwan occupies Ituaba, which is the largest of the islands in the Spratlys, about half a square mile. Um, and it's been there since 1956, uh, originally occupied in 1947. It also occupies a feature called Pratas Reef, which is up in the very north of the South China Sea. It's not claimed by anybody except China or Taiwan. Um, basically right at the mouth of the Bashi Channel that leads into the Taiwan Strait, and it is occupied by Taiwanese forces. So one area where you could imagine these, these interacting is that as China seeks to squeeze Taiwan, turn the screws on Taiwan without provoking military intervention from the U.S. or anybody else, two obvious targets would be Pratas or Ituaba, where China could engage in a short, sharp military uh, escalation, probably without provoking foreign intervention. I'd also note that a lot of the same gray zone tactics that we see employed in the South China Sea are employed in the Taiwan Strait, involving China's Coast Guard, um, China's aerial patrols. We also see this in the East China Sea, kind of across the board. What China tries to do is use its quantitative advantages to wear down um, states with which it has disputes. This is one of the reasons that the Taiwanese Air Force has stopped scrambling in response to Chinese incursions into Taiwanese airspace, because they simply can't keep up. Uh, and that's that's the point. China knows that it's grinding down Taiwanese readiness by doing this. Gregory, thanks for coming on the show. Great to have you on. To close out today's episode, we'll turn to who will discuss China's courting of the Pacific Island countries, gray zone tactics, the importance of regional forums in the Indo-Pacific, and what Canada can learn from Australia as it navigates its relationship with China and the region. Dr. Blaxlin, pleasure to have you on again. Thanks for making time to speak with me today. How do these recent incidents between Chinese and Filipino vessels in the South China Sea impact the ongoing territorial disputes in the region? And what is the broader significance of this incident for regional security? It's great to be with you. Uh, so one of the things that's really important from my understanding of international relations and my limited understanding of international law is that possession is broadly speaking nine-tenths of the law. 
uh, and uh, by acknowledging or giving up on contesting a claim, uh, contesting China's claim, would add legitimacy to their claims over the, the South China Sea, even though the arbitral tribunal ruling of 2016 ruled in the Philippines' favour. China has, for the last seven years, been working assiduously to undermine uh, the Philippines' claim and the claim of all the other Southeast Asian contiguous uh, South China Sea states. Uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, the Philippines, and of course, Taiwan as well. So this is a really interesting dynamic at work. What we've seen happen in the last few days, though, in, in the last few weeks, I should say, is a change of tactics and a change of heart from the Filipinos. The Philippines government is taking a much more forth, forthright approach, uh, much more forward leaning, and they are actively using media as a weapon. They are filming, they are putting up online on social media, they're exposing the, the kind of the, 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 the um, the, the duplicity of China's approach, if you like, the um, talking and not walking uh, in the same way. Talking about cooperation and collaboration, talking about, uh, you know, establishing a, a code of conduct for the South China Sea, and of course, doing everything but doing that in practice. With um, Coast Guard vessels that have literally got ramming irons at the front, uh, echoing, you know, gladiatorial times of a couple of millennia ago. Um, and uh, it's, it's extraordinary the uh, approach, that the heavy-handed approach that uh, has been applied to the Philippines that they're now cleverly pushing back on. And, of course, along the way, they've mustered support from a range of countries, not just the United States, but Japan, uh, Australia, and even Canada. Uh, we, you know, it's a surprising uh shared resolve to actually support the Philippines in taking this stand um, in, uh, in, in the contested waters in the space that uh, China has felt it could uh, rule uh, with impunity, and that is evidently not proving to be the case. China has employed grey zone tactics to assert its maritime claims. Can you elaborate on the nature of these tactics and how they challenge the status quo in the South China Sea? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's actually quite clever. Um, China has uh, been avoiding using grey hulled ships, so no pl platforms of war, no navy ships, but it's been very happy to use its Coast Guard vessels and its armed maritime militia vessels to intimidate, to occupy, to block, and to dominate uh, the spaces around contested islands and the contested waters of the South China Sea. And this echoes. Uh, uh, an approach, you know, it speaks to a, a sense, I guess, of China's sense of its own weaknesses and limitations, the vulnerabilities and the dangers of a kinetic approach, a kinetic approach to resolving the, the dispute. What I mean by that is that <clears throat> China has a sense that it knows where the line is and it seeks actively to avoid crossing it, but it gets right up to the edge of it in terms of what's To what's tolerable, what's likely to avoid goading uh, uh, the Philippines' as principal ally, the United States, into a more forceful response. And that's, the, that's that twilight zone, the grey zone, if you like, where you're operating short of war uh, and short of uh, complete peaceful uh, uh, coexistence. <clears throat> There's a lot of competition and contestation in that space. Uh, it's not quite kinetic, but it is pretty forceful, and it's about using the full domain of um, the electromagnetic spectrum, if you like, in terms of um, cyber attacks, in terms of blocking of radio frequencies, in terms of messaging, uh, sending out messages or blocking other messages getting out there and, and trying to dominate the information battle. Uh, mindful that in circumstances short of war, Uh, where we have contestation but not war, not open conflict, that information battle is the key domain in which 
states are influenced and shaped to make decisions for or against a certain policy. And that's where I think China has been actively trying to intimidate and push back, get uh, concessions. But it's ironic, isn't it, Josh? Because this is just, you know, fairly clod-hopping behaviour in some respects. You'd think that they would have learned that this is this is counterproductive, especially, you know, when you think about what uh, the previous uh, uh, Philippine president, Rodrigo Duterte, some people used to call him Duterte Harry, you know, because uh, it was go ahead, make my day kind of approach to, to the rule of law. Um, but, you know, interestingly enough, Duterte Harry is the same guy who makes a deal with President Xi, basically rolls over. He's very happy trigger happy back in the Philippines but when it comes to international relations he rolls over and tickle tickle my tummy please President Xi so he walks back from the arbitral tribunal ruling that is President Aquino before him had, had had pushed for basically says look we don't care about the arbitral tribunal ruling hoping that by you know offering a carrot that he will induce some kind of concessions out of China but President Xi just can't even bring himself to make any concessions. So he keeps pushing, keeps pushing in on the Scarborough Shoal, on Thomas Shoal, uh, on the whole of the, the edges of the, the, the nine dash line. And even at the end of Rodrigo Duterte's term as president, he gives up, basically walks back and basically turns back to the United States. Why? Because he, he, can, he can't get any concessions out of China because the Chinese approach under President Xi is a very kind of, it's binary, it's, it's mine or yours, and I want it. What are the key motivations behind China's engagement with Pacific Island nations, and how does this fit into its broader foreign policy goals? It's very interesting. You know, when China signed up to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in 1982, it signed up to an exclusive economic zone that for a population of now 1.4 billion people was proportionally minuscule. So... They have, um, like the rest of us, they love fish protein, right? They love fish. Uh, and, uh, and when you're trying to feed 1.4 billion people who like fish, you have to go looking hard to find fish, particularly when you've absolutely overfished your own uh, domestic waters. So on one level, it's perfectly understandable that China should want to access the fishery stocks of the South Pacific, um, and uh, and that, and do deals there. The problem is, of course, as we all know, is that there's they're not doing it in half measures. They're just cleaning it out on an industrial scale in a, in a non-sustainable way. Uh, so this is actually affecting fishery stocks for the whole world, not just for China, and it's certainly uh, having a very negative effect for the South Pacific in a way that while people may be being paid kickbacks for turning a blind eye to Chinese actions, uh, those people who are the beneficiaries of those kickbacks are not necessarily the ones who suffer the consequences of fish stock depletion. Beyond fish fishery stocks, there is the question of seabed resources. And we know that the technologies to exploit seabed resources is getting better and better. And the seabed, uh, seabeds under the exclusive economic zones of the South Pacific are enormous. Now this, we forget this, Josh. When you look at a map of the Pacific, you think of just little, little black ink dots on the map that barely are identifiable. In fact, the name of the island is usually much bigger than the island itself. And that's by the name of it that you even see it on the map. But when you add their exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles around these islands, you get what they call in the Pacific Islands from the Blue Pacific, this idea of this economic zone that is actually way bigger than the land masses it's themselves. And it is that space that is ripe for exploitation, for economic exploitation, both in terms of fishery stocks, in terms of seabed resources and so on. But then there's the third dimension, which is on the land. And here on the land, you've got the opportunities to exploit um, native forests, um, and other resources on, on, the, on, the, on the islands, in addition to the strategic utility of having political influence that enables you perhaps to, uh, as we're seeing in the Solomon Islands, establish a security arrangement whereby uh, China seeks to ingratiate itself to become 
uh, the uh, force of choice when it comes to security guarantees. So the great irony is that after two decades of Australia, New Zealand, Fiji and others conducting peace support operations in Solomon Islands under the Ramsey program, Regional Assistance Mission Solomon Islands, um, the, the Prime Minister of, of, of Solomon Islands, uh, Manasa Sokovari, spurns uh, Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea and others turns to China as this great new benefactor, as if they've been there doing all the heavy lifting. It's really quite extraordinary, the game that's been played there. And it is uh, very much, I would contend, more a game of go than a game of chess. And I think that's a useful metaphor to explore further. The China Solomon Islands Security Pact raised the possibility of a Chinese naval base in the South Pacific. That seems to have been dismissed for the time being, but what would the implications of this be? So China is deliberately not seeking to plonk grey-hulled ships in Honiara, the port capital city of Solomon Islands, or in other uh, Pacific Island ports. They know that that, for now at least, is a bridge too far. But what they're doing is setting up arrangements that give them privileged access should they need to initially through coast guards, fishing fleets, and obviously laying the groundwork for other security. So already in the Philippines, sorry, in the Solomon Islands, we've seen police training. So uh, from mainland China, police forces come to train and, and equip the Solomon Islands police forces, even though for years they've been receiving this kind of training from Australia right, and from New Zealand. So it's like really... Was that all that necessary? And Manasseh Sogavari is playing a very um, cynical hand here, uh, exploiting vulnerabilities, exploiting our goodwill and the fact that we don't offer brown paper bags. That's not what we do. We're legally constrained from doing that. Others aren't. And uh, he is uh, working, working all of the uh, limitations of what an open liberal rule-based democracy seeks to uh, operate by and that that presents a real challenge so but having said all that it's useful to keep in mind that um, while uh, the foreign minister Wang Yi a couple of years ago did a lap of the Pacific just after the Australian federal elections when Anthony Albanese was elected I think he anticipated that that would take about a week to sort out but it, it was resolved very quickly and he was doing a lap of the Pacific, trying to get all of the Pacific Island nations to sign up to this one size fits all Chinese security deal for the Pacific, which the overwhelming majority of them rejected. The Solomon Islands being the principal exception. Um, and uh, it, it, it kind of was a bit of a wake up call in Washington. So we've, we've had now the second time a the Pacific leaders meeting in Washington at the White House with the, with the president, as well as with Australia involved. Um, and that has been very, very welcome. Uh, and we've, so we've seen a resurgence in acknowledgement and interest in the Pacific from the United States and, to be honest, from Australia and other countries like India as well. And of course, this echoes one of the phenomena which I, as a historian, am reminded of routinely, and that is that when, um, when it came to an existential crisis and an existential challenge to Australia in uh, 1942, with the Japanese onslaught to the south. Where did Japan focus its efforts? It focused its efforts on what we now call Solomon Islands, um, in particular, the island of Guadalcanal, which is where the US Marines fought the major battle, where the Battle of Savo Island and the Iron Bottom Sound uh, is, is, uh, is located, where many, many US ships were, uh, were sunk, including Australian ships. HMAS Canberra was lost there. Um, and it's, in fact, that's one of the reasons why the US Navy has a ship called USS Canberra, named after HMAS Canberra that was sunk fighting alongside US naval uh, assets in the defence of US forces in, in Guadalcanal. Um, so interesting dynamics at work. History echoes, doesn't repeat, uh, but we do need to be mindful of the past as we look into the future. Well, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Blackland. I have one more question for you pertaining to uh, Australia, specifically uh, alliances and the so what for our Canadian audience. 
Um, mm. So Australia's participation uh, in regional forums and security dialogues like the Quad and ASEAN uh, has arguably expanded its influence in the region. So um, what key lessons do you think Canada might be able to draw from Australia's experiences in balancing its economic interests with its security concerns uh, when dealing with China? So consistency is really important. And China, um, China, Canada, I should say, is seen around the region as a inconsistent friend. It blows hot and cold uh, from the mid nineties when you had a team Canada lap of East Asia seeking to stitch up trade deals and you know wave the Canadian flag to then crickets thereafter for a pr prolonged period of time. Um, and uh, what I think is useful for Canadians to do is to remember that you are a Pacific nation as well. You are as close to uh, the Northeast Asian hotspots as Australia is. We forget that the Mercator projection is not real. The world is round, it's not flat. And um, you in the Second World War appreciated this when we had two brigades of troops uh, uh, surrendering to the Japanese in Singapore, you had a brigade of troops surrendering to the Japanese in Hong Kong. Now, conceptually, it wasn't wrong to try and defend them. They were just inadequately done. Um, but you guys have had a long appreciation when the chips are down of the importance of allied contributing to allied efforts and coalition efforts in the Pacific. You actually conducted an amphibious lodgement on Kiska Island uh, in, uh, I think it was 1943. Back then, people thought it was going to be a major battle. Uh, it turned out to be a non-event, largely because the Japanese had already left. But the point is, the point of me mentioning this is that you guys are prepared, when it comes to the crunch, you're prepared to do some heavy lifting. And, and in, my, in my experience, and I'm a former uh, military officer, and I was involved in the intervention in East Timor in 1999, and when it came to the crunch, Canada was there, right? You sent the Van Dues, uh, on land, you sent the RCAF with Hercules aircraft, and you sent uh, HMCS Protector uh, as the supply ship to help out, providing critical support to the Australian-led coalition. You guys are not just fair, fair, fair the weather friends, you're friends in time of need, but it's good to keep the history lessons in mind because it's easy enough to be distracted. And you have... Uh, challenges in many other places. You know, one of my teachers when I was doing my PhD at, at, at Kingston uh, in, in Canada many years ago, reminded me of the point that Canada is a regional power looking for a region. You know, you guys, we have a very clear region in Australia. Um, for Canada, you can get pulled to Haiti, you can get pulled to Africa, you can get pulled to the Middle East, which we get pulled to as well, to be fair. Um, uh, and, and you've got the Arctic to worry about. You've got, you know, your east and west coast. And, of course, you've got defence against help, as we all know, you know, against Big Brother down south. Um, but when you think about this, and this is one of the things about my book when I was doing my PhD now with McGill Queen's University Press called Strategic Cousins, Canadian and Australian Expeditionary Forces and the British and American Empires, is that when it comes to the crunch, Canada, like Australia, is on the side of good. We do the right thing. You guys do the right thing. Um, and you have been there alongside Australians since the Battle of Amiens, the Black Day of the German Army in 1918, right through uh, through the, the, the war in the Pacific uh, and East Timor in 99, in Afghanistan and, uh, and, and beyond. And as we think about how we can sort out and help out Ukraine, I know Canada and Australia are working alongside each other to train. But we face another challenge in the Pacific. We, 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 face, we face a significant challenge to the order that we have been beneficiaries of for the last three generations. And as we think about the implications of that, it's really good for Canada to be involved and to swap notes extensively with your cousins down under. Well, pleasure having you on again, Dr. Blaxland. Thanks for taking some time, and I hope things are going well for you out there in D.C. Look forward to speaking with you in the future. That's all for this week's episode of the CDA Institute Expert Series. To learn more about the CDA Institute, you can visit our website at cdainstitute.ca or subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks, and we hope you'll be joining us next week.